The stories in this video are not stories at all, but articles. Articles about paranormal events that were published in real newspapers 100 years ago. I've spent a lot of time wondering about hauntings. When I hear about people being visited by family or clinging to treasured objects, it makes sense to me. But there are other times when there's no family around or items worth accounting for that make me curious. Now I'm getting ahead of myself. So without further interruption, I present to you Ghost News, a haunted house in Pittsburgh. Originally published in the Dayton Daily Empire, May 4th, 1865. A gentleman, newly arrived in Pittsburgh from New York, rented a house on Pennsylvania Avenue. He soon discovered that his house was haunted. He saw male and female spirits flitting across the room and heard the usual unearthly sounds. He became much alarmed and invited a number of his friends to his house for the purpose of solving the mystery. Among those present was a reporter of the Chronicle who writes as follows. Books were lifted from the tables and slammed down upon another. Bells were rung all through the room. The piano, although tightly locked up, was played. A guitar suspended above the chandelier where no human hand could reach it was made to discourse most excellent music. Doors tightly locked were opened and slammed shut. Sparks of fire were carried about the room. One fellow, a disbeliever in spiritualism, was choked by an unseen hand and almost frightened out of his wits. Many other marvelous things were witnessed. The phantoms which appeared were a beautiful woman and a most horrid demon who seemed to attend upon her. The skeptic above alluded to made a frantic attempt to seize the female figure, which instantly vanished and left him insensible upon the floor when the landlord tried to put a bullet through the demon by firing a pistol at him. The place after these violent demonstrations became too hot for either occupants or visitors, and the house was vacated and is not available to rent. The other papers of the city pronounce the report nonsensical, but state that it is producing mischievous results. The Dispatch of Friday says, During all day yesterday, the crowd visiting the home in which the startling revelations were supposed to have occurred were very large. Last night, about 8 o'clock, a credulous assembly numbering not less than 500 persons congregated around the haunted mansion to see what could be seen. Their enthusiasm arose to such a pitch that for a time, a demolition of the structure was seriously threatened. And as it was, many of the windows were broken and other parts of the house abused by missiles hurled by the crowd. Alderman Butler, Mayor Laurie, the Chief of Police, and the officers of the emergency force were present and dispersed the curiously inclined after some difficulty. All we have to say is the property is depreciated at least two-thirds in value by the publication of such manifested anomalies. How strange! Do you think the demon was keeping the woman's ghost trapped in the house? And why? Make sure to tell me your thoughts in the comments. Also, don't forget to give this video a like before leaving. Before I end this video, I just want to point out that if anyone's looking for a place to rent, the one in this story should be pretty cheap. <clears throat> it's the least I could do. <laughs>
You know what almost never happens right after a paranormal event? Nothing. Almost every time something happens afterwards. People run out, paranormal investigators run in, but people just sitting there doesn't really happen. Well, what if the people that witnessed the paranormal event couldn't leave? What would happen if they were in jail? Tonight's story is from the Iola Register, June 22nd, 1888. It was late, around 10 o'clock. Warden Brockway and Deputy Smith were sitting in the main office when the sound of screams filled the air. The screams were coming from the corridor where long-term prisoners were kept. When the warden and deputy went to investigate, they found a prisoner, John Jones, terrified out of his mind. He claimed he'd seen the ghost of murderer Adam Volkovich at his cell door. While alive, Volkovich earned himself a nasty reputation. He wasn't someone to be trifled with. He was housed in the same jail until April 3rd, the day he was executed in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. The warden and deputy waited a few moments, but nothing happened. Dismissing the claim, they started to leave, and John Jones started screaming again. In an effort to calm him down, they took him to another cell. Later that night, Watchman McDonald was startled by the sound of screaming. Again, it was John Jones, claiming Volkovich had come to him again, but he wasn't alone this time. Other inmates were carrying on about the paranormal sights and sounds they experienced that night. Watchman McDonald again changed John Jones' cell. After that, things in the jail quieted down, but many of the inmates were unable to sleep that night. Whoa! I just realized our first two episodes of Ghost News both came from Pennsylvania. What's up with that place? I better double check the next article to make sure it's from somewhere else. When the warden returned to the main office that night, he couldn't find the cup of coffee he was drinking and began to suspect it was an elaborate plot to steal it. That's right, he thinks he got... mugged! The stories in this video are not stories at all, but articles. Articles about paranormal events that were published in real newspapers 100 years ago. What is residual energy? Are the participants aware? Do they feel anything? Are they forced to relive the same traumatic moments over and over during their death? Tonight's article is from Massachusetts, 1883, where the ghost of a murderer and his victims have been rehearsing the murders every night. There's a hundred-year-old farmhouse, the Old Hambit Homestead, situated near the boundary line of Wareham and Middleborough, Massachusetts. In its 100 years, it has been the scene of two known murders, though now people are suspecting the number might be much higher than that. The last recorded murder was the tragic murder of a little girl. She was found beheaded in the house's cellar. No arrests were made. It was a terrible mystery that was never solved, and everyone forgot about, until three weeks ago. Some school children were on their way home when they saw a girl run out of the old farmhouse screaming. She was immediately followed by a tall, shadowy man who grabbed her and started pulling her towards the house. The girl resisted, so the man hit her on the head and dragged her body inside. The children were frozen in place watching. They watched until the man dragged the girl to a part of the house that couldn't be seen from the windows. Then a loud sound was heard followed by the sound of many screaming women. 
This screaming snapped the children out of their trance and sent them all running for home. The next night, eight young men met up in the woods bordering the house of the alleged sightings to investigate. From their position in the woods, the men could see both men and women frantically walking past the windows, and unearthly shrieks could be heard. Then, as quickly as it started, it all stopped. The light, the shrieks, and the frantic movement. All gone. A half an hour the men waited and saw nothing going on in the old house. After half an hour, the house was again illuminated. This time, the eight men, suspecting this was some sort of trick or prank, ran towards the farmhouse. But as they got closer, the light, the sounds, and the people would vanish. At this point, one of the men abandoned the other seven and ran to the village. When he arrived, he was carrying on about what he saw and passed out. The other men didn't see anything else, so they returned to the village and confirmed everything the first man had said happened. Two nights later, a man and his family were passing by the house while on the way to New Bedford. The house appeared to be on fire. The horses were so frightened, they started running and wouldn't stop until they were a quarter mile away. The horses refused to turn around, so the man went on foot to see what was wrong. The road he was on was curved so he decided to walk through a small wooded area to save some time. While walking through the wooded patch, he lost sight of the house for a moment and could not find it again, even when out of the woods in front of where the house was. The man was confused by this and continued to New Bedford where he told people what had happened. With the news of the haunting spreading, some well-known professional spiritualists went to visit the property. While they didn't see anything, they reported hearing female voices, sometimes singing, sometimes screaming, and a deep pounding sound like a bass drum. A gentleman named William R. Luce, who lives near the Middleborough Line, has also come forward about the paranormal activity at the old farmhouse. He says that while passing by one evening, he noticed the lights from inside the house. He was worried the abandoned property was being used by thieves and degenerates, and stopped his horse. He could see through the window a group of women moving frantically up the stairs, then a series of screams and thuds as one of the women appeared to be thrown down the steps. Mr. Luce ran over to investigate, but as he approached, the lights dimmed. The people faded, and the house stood there abandoned. The owner of the property, Mr. Gibbs, is now petitioned daily to tear down the place. Some locals are worried that someone will take matters into their own hands and burn it down themselves. What was at one point considered by everyone to be a childish prank is now being taken very seriously after all of these sightings. So what do you guys think? Are these apparitions experiencing what's happening? Or is this some mindless repeating of the same thing over and over? Let me know in the comments. The owner, Mr. Gibbs, was asked what he thought caused the hauntings. He said he wasn't sure, but heard that years before he acquired the property, it was owned by a dairy farmer that went mad. One summer, the cow started to look distressed, and all at once stopped producing milk. The dairy farmer improved their living space and also brought in the most expensive cow food he could. The cow started to calm down, and a few weeks later, the milk came back. There was only one problem. After having their stalls improved and eating all that expensive food, the milk came out spoiled. Get it? Spoiled? Ah! <laughs> ah!